God is God is good. So, um, I I was reading this passage uh, uh, this week uh, in Numbers, Numbers uh, four through seven, and it's it's a little difficult to say do a, a thirty minute message on how a je je jealous husband should give his his wife bitter water to see whether or not she is tormented by it. Um, so I decided to let that one let one, that one pass. But uh, wanted to speak this morning on the Nazarite vow because God is a God of equal opportunity. Uh, contrary to what much of the world may think, uh, he is equal opportunity. Uh, why don't more people turn to God and receive his blessings? We have to ask ourselves, why not? I mean, they, they, everybody, he's not willing that anybody should perish, but very few uh, turn towards him. Um, I think that the reason people don't turn to him is uh, for one of two reasons, or maybe both. They either think that they don't need God, or they think that they're not good enough to receive uh, God's salvation. And all people are made in the image of God. He wants everyone to repent and turn to him. He is our rock and our redeemer. We see this from the scripture on Shabbat, and if you use the Siddur on the weekdays, uh, you find it there too that he's our rock and our redeemer. Abraham's seed was, uh, the children of Israel were set apart. They were chosen to be a, a light to the nations. And who are the nations? The nations are everyone except Israel. And so the message of repentance and drawing near to God was and is available to everybody because even the children of Israel would be a light to the nations so that they would see salvation through God Almighty. In this week's Parsha, Numbers 4 through 7, we see that there are boundaries, yet there, the boundaries aren't forever necessarily. If you're unclean, you're outside of the camp until you are clean. And then a husband cannot be jealous of his wife and carry on that jealousy forever, uh, uh, breaking up the marriage because of a real or perceived act of unfaithfulness. The remedy uh, was for the wife to drink a special water mixture um, and, and bitter water. We don't know what it was concocted of, but if she didn't have a reaction to it, she was innocent, and so any jealousy couldn't go on forever and ever. If she was innocent, I, I, I too believe, before I cough, <coughs> or after I cough, I, I, I think that if she was innocent, she praised God. I have some coffee here. So I'm good, Jim. While Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests, God set apart a tr the tribe of Levi, Levi to perform the functions around the temple in close proximity to God. The Kohen, the priests, were the ones closest to God, serving in the inner part of the tabernacle. The Levites, the son of Aaron, were consecrated to special service to God. Their office and their function couldn't be questioned. It couldn't be changed. No one, though, could be afraid of them or think that they were the only ones consecrated to God because God made provision for any, anyone to take a vow, a Nazarite vow, to be set apart and consecrated to him. Being consecrated to him was not limited to a set of people. It was uh, available to every one of the children of Israel if they would, wanted to take the Nazarite vow if they were willing. So here in Numbers, the Hebrew name for the book is uh, Bambadar in the wilderness. In chapter 5, we read about those who are isolated from the camp. God tells Moses, everyone with Sarat, uh, uh, which was commonly translated as leprosy, but it's not leprosy, who has some kind of discharge or any, cont or any contamination by a dead body, whether male or female, you are to send them outside of the camp, so not to, to uh, defile the camp where I am dwelling among them. 
then God has Moses tell the children of Israel what to do. It says, if a spirit of jealousy overcomes a man uh, and he is suspicious of his wife uh, when she is impure, or a spirit of jealousy overcomes him, he suspects his wife, and yet she is not impure, then she is brought before the priest. She drinks this bitter water, has the water test, to see whether or not she's been unfaithful. And then in chapter 6, we go from those who are outside of the camp and jealous husbands to those people who want to make a vow to be completely separated to Adonai. Chapter 6, verse 2 says, Any man or woman who desires a vow uh, to vow a Nazarite vow to be separated from Adonai can do so. And then it goes on to say what they, they needed to do. And making a Nazarite vow to separate yourself for, uh, to Adonai is an equal opportunity for both men and women. It's not just for men or for women. It was for both men and women. And you could do it for any reason. There is no restriction or even guidance for that matter on why you would take the vow. Uh, there's no time set for a Nazarite vow. Usually it was for 30 days. But right at the beginning of the vow, you would say for how long it was going to be, usually for 30 days, uh, but it could be longer. It could be, you know, three years, it could be six months, whatever you decided that it would be. But you kept that vow until the end of the period that you said that you would do it. Otherwise, you'd be violating the vow. And the declaration was made in front of witnesses. There were lifetime vows, like those made by the mothers of Samson and John the Immerser and for Samuel. However, the bulk of the vows that we know of were for anywhere from a month to a couple of years. And during that time, you wouldn't cut your hair. You wouldn't go next to a dead body. You would abstain from wine and any fermented drink. Verse 5 says, he is not to drink any vinegar made from wine or any fermented drink or any grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. All during his days as a Nazarite, he is not to eat anything from the grapevine, even the seeds or the skins. It is thought that the prohibition on grapes had to do with Canaanite fertility, um, uh, 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 the, the symbolism that was there of the grapes. However, it could be as simple as grapes being a common staple uh, that people taking the Nazarite vow would abstain from so that people would see that you were abstaining from that just as much as not cutting your hair was an obvious sign that you were taking a Nazarite vow. Uh, this was completely opposite of how people took vows in the ancient Middle East. The common way was to shave the head. And so in, in uh, Judaism, as it was then, this was completely different. With the Nazarite vow, you didn't cut your hair until the vow was completed. And the vow was completed by making offerings at the tabernacle and then later at the temple. You might remember the in the book of Acts, Luke and Paul and the others arrive in Jerusalem and Paul tells uh, James, Jacob, um, how wonderful things are going with the Gentiles. But there are reports coming in uh, that say that they are teaching uh, that all Jewish people among the Gentiles should forsake Moses. That's in Acts 21 and verse uh, 21. Um, they 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 say they have been uh, told about you that you teach all Jewish people among Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise your children or walk according to the customs. And clearly, this was not the message that should be communicated, nor was it communicated by Paul and the people along Paul's journey, spreading the gospel. Paul's message to the Jewish people was never to forsake Torah. Uh, according to his letter to the Romans, Paul taught that being faithful to God increases your desire to follow Torah, not the other way around. Uh, Romans chapter 3 is, is about that. Uh, the more you grow in your faith, the more uh, you want to do what 
the Lord has commanded. But anyway, verse 22 of Acts 21 says, Jacob, James, uh, and the elders ask, What's to be done then? No doubt they will hear that you have come to Jerusalem. So do what we tell you. Take four men who have a vow on themselves. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Uh, that way all will realize there is nothing to these things that have been told about you, but you yourself walk in an orderly manner, keeping the Torah. We know these four men have taken a Nazarite vow because they're going to be shaving their heads. And so in verse 26 it says, the next day, Paul took the men, purifying himself along with them. They went into the temple, announcing when the days of purification would be completed and uh, the sacrifice uh, would be offered uh, for each one of them. And so they went up to the temple. And they said, the vow is going to be done in seven days, and then we will off make our offering and, and cut the hair. The Nazarite vow involved a separation to God to do something or stop doing something. The vow could be done anywhere. Uh, we see Paul getting his hair cut in Corinth and, and in Acts 18. But you, you could try to get out of your vow by having your hair cut at Corinth like Paul did. But you'd have to do the vow again in the land of Israel. Because Israel is the only place where you can get, you can complete the vow, and you have to complete it at the temple. And so uh, Paul goes with the men in Acts 21, uh, uh, possibly to complete his vow again, because obviously getting the haircut in Corinth didn't do the job. Who knows? Maybe it was hot and humid that day, and he had just had it with the long hair. The Nazarite vow was ordained by God. The Nazarite uh, was consecrated to God for the entire length of the vow until the vow was closed out at the temple with the offerings. And by the way, the Nazarite vow isn't applicable today. I, I've heard some people say, I'm taking a Nazarite vow. You, you, you can do it today, but you can never complete it because you can't complete it until the temple is available again. And so you'd be in a perpetual Nazarite vow. Among the offerings, someone under a Nazarite vow brought to the temple to complete the vow was a sin offering. And a question discussed by Jewish scholars for centuries has been, why a sin offering? If making yourself separated to Adonai is a good thing, why, why is a sin offering included? And one possible reason, it's argued, is that the Nazarite is making a sin offering in order to enter back into the world, away from the holy and into the commonplace, so sort of a rite of passage. Uh, but it's kind of difficult to make sense of that argument because it sort of defies logic, because you have to enter back into the world. Why would you, you know, uh, uh, make an offering, a sin offering ahead of time? Uh, the ancient scholar and philosopher of Maimonides offers a different take, that the person who undertook a Nazarite vow actually became a sinner. And this is where it uh, becomes applicable to us uh, today. Maimonides stated that a Nazarite was considered a saint because of the vow that he took or she took, and that there is a difference between a saint and a sage. A saint gives up things and excludes himself or herself from the common life in order to be separated unto God, and in doing so is capable of doing the vow for selfish reasons. He or she could start out with the best intentions, but then slide down the slippery slope of being so consumed by being separated unto God that he or she neglects caring for family or friends or neighbors. And becoming pious, they become so pious that they actually slip over the edge into sinning by neglecting those around them. In other words, they love God with all their heart, all their mind, and all their soul so much that they neglect the other commandment, which is to love your neighbor. Maimonides thought that it was plausible 
to have that reasoning for the sin offering because you'd be sinning. You may not have taken a Nazarite vow, yet you could be so zealous for God uh, today that people are neglected. Zeal for God can go to the extreme where the doing is more important than God himself and you wind up neglecting him and the people around you. We have to continually do self-checks. We have people around us who can hold us accountable so that we can keep from mistaking being busy for God as having a deep relationship with him. It's entirely possible to be so zealous for God that you lose sight of the humanity around you. It is possible to be so zealous for God that we believe that we need to act as the arm of God instead of acting as a vessel for the Holy Spirit to be working through us. We need to let our light so shine so that people see us reflecting Messiah Yeshua and being available for God to work through us. Uh, we, however, are not, are not God. Maimonides sees a saint as being one who is highly self-absorbed and thereby sinning because their zeal for God has become misguided. And a Nazarite is self-indulgent because instead of living for the world, they wished to be separated from it. And I'll tell you, I, w I would love to spend like a year or two or the rest of my life hold up in the Black Hills in a cabin somewhere and focus on God. But that doesn't do anything for the Great Commission either by not going out and making disciples. But because uh, the Nazarite is being self-indulgent and separated from the world, uh, he, he or she is choosing a life to be separated from the world for, for which he was created to live in. And that that is a sin, and hence a sin offering. Because we're, we're created to be in the world. We're not of this world. Our kingdom is in the world to come. But he has planted us here. And we can't neglect this world and the people that are in it who need to be discipled. He also saw that people who lived lives, that's Maimonides, uh, also saw people who lived lives completely separate from the world as self-segregated, lonely, and not really interested in society. On the other hand, Maimonides sees what he terms a sage as being someone who can balance their zeal for God uh, and care for the humanity that is around him. Loving God and his or her neighbor at the same time, balancing giving his or her all to both God and his family and friends and neighbors. And it takes wisdom, the wisdom of God, to know how to do that. It takes discernment to balance our relationship in devotion to God with your relationship to your fellow humans of the world. Taking a Nazarite vow in of itself did not produce sin, requiring a sin offering. It just seems that after 30 days or 3 years or 30 years, it was possible to slide down that slippery slope into self-deception that doing it was the same as serving him. I think that there was, uh, there, uh, there's the, um, the story of the Good Samaritan that can be a good example and it, it's talking about the Levite and the priests. It doesn't say that they were Nazarites but you remember the man is left to die on the road and the man is near death uh, according to the scriptures. If he were to die in the presence of in the arms of the Levite or the priest then they would be unclean and would not be able to serve in the temple until they were uh, clean. They had done their period of time to uh, be clean uh, but they wouldn't be able to serve at the temple in the meantime. And I think that their zeal to serve God was more important to them than the doing the right thing, which was attempting to save a life at all costs. On the other hand, John the Mercer and Samuel were able to live consecrated for God, yet function in the world. They lived as sages, being wise and depending on God's wisdom to navigate the world while being separated to God. So a sage needs to know the dangers of excess 
and ways to conflict between living devoted to God and living in this world. And as believers, we need to live as sages. Certainly we are called saints, but we are not to be so separated from this world that we don't have relationships with fellow human beings. We have to interact in order to share the good news of Yeshua. And we need to build each other up in faith and hold each other accountable before God. We need to balance our zeal for God, our zeal for the scriptures with serving and loving people around us. It, it takes wisdom, it takes discernment, and we will fumble from time to time, but then we can repent and then move on. Then at the end of page, uh, chapter 6, we, we suddenly swap around to the priestly blessing. And you have to ask yourself, what does the priestly blessing have to do with the Nazarite vow? Well, first a little bit of history. The priestly blessing dates to the early 6th century. Uh, they found in Jerusalem, they found uh, a small amulet uh, about an inch long that were two scrolls that contained uh, the, the priestly vow. And so it's one of the oldest or the oldest prayer among Jews. And here at this fellowship, we say the blessing to each other uh, as being part of a holy priesthood as members of the body of Messiah. And we certainly do, don't say the blessing on one another as often as we should. I think that we as believers should offer blessings upon people uh, as often as possible. In Judaism, the, the priests do not bless the people, but it is through them that God blesses the people through this blessing and other blessings. It is a blessing that should keep us from going astray as we're ministering to Adonai and to the people around us. So let's go through it real quick. Numbers 6, starting at verse 23, it says, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you are to bless the children of Israel by saying to them, Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai make his face to shine on you and to be gracious to you. Adonai turn his face toward you and grant you shalom. In this way, they are to place my name over the children of Israel, and so I will bless them. So Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai give you what you deserve or even what you don't deserve to protect you. May he give you your daily bread, provide for your daily needs to make from Yeshua's pattern of prayer. May he protect us from the evil one. And then he blesses us because he forms us. He formed us. He created us. God knows. Uh, God doesn't give up on us. Uh, he knows our very being and our spiritual needs. God doesn't give up on us. He is not willing that any of us should perish, but all come to eternal life. We just need to reach out and accept his love for us instead of rejecting it. If only we could see ourselves as God sees us. He always wants us to choose blessing instead of curse. He always wants us to choose life. And then... The next part of the blessing says, Adonai, make his face to shine upon you. That the Shekinah glory would emanate from Adonai and your face would light up so that others would see him reflected in your face. And you may have heard or used terms like, may your light so shine, uh, that the light comes from the radiance of Yeshua. And... Because we are his creation, we reflect him back to him as well. We love him because he first loved us. His face shines upon us, making himself evident in our life. And then the next part says, May he be gracious to you, showing you grace and undeserved merit. Your protection comes from his grace and his mercy. You may not deserve it, but he does it. Adonai, turn his face toward you. When someone turns their face toward you, they show favor towards you. May he grant you shalom, the peace that passes all understanding. The blessing places his name over them, and in this way, 
he bless, uh, they are blessed by him. So again, the question is, what does the Nazarite vow and one of the oldest prayers have in common? What do they have in common uh, with the rest of the Parsha, concerned with the offerings to the tri of the tribes, jealousy of the husband and keeping the unclean outside of the camp? Perhaps it's that the shalom found at the end of the priestly blessing is the answer. To build on an idea from uh, Rabbi Lord, Lord Sachs, real shalom, real peace, is found when there is a harmonious coexistence between believers. That sounds like a lot to digest before, before lunchtime. But each believer brings a unique contribution, a distinctive nature into the world. Shalom is not uniformity, but integrated diversity. That was Lord Sachs' uh, idea. And Saul Paul, the apostle, speaks this way in describing the body of Messiah as an organism, each person with a distinct function within the congregation. Uh, we also have the shalom, the peace given to us by the Holy Spirit. And our true shalom, and she, uh, Sabbath or Shabbat rest is found in the world to come in the new Jerusalem when we shall be at complete rest in God. And we see all of those other believers there who were not just like us, but still got there anyway. From before Abraham to some point into the future, these believers come. They will wind up in the same place that we are. And we'll look at them and we'll go, Wow, I, I sure didn't like you, but you're here too. <laughs> Our true shalom and rest is found in the New Jerusalem. And when we see the other people there, we might wonder why we didn't get along better in the world that we left behind. There's another aspect uh, to this in that through the Nazarite vow, any person could come uh, to be like the priest taking... Uh, by taking the vow, the, the priesthood wasn't just uh, the, the only way that you'd be consecrated to God. This is a prophetic pointing to anyone being able to come into fellowship with God by repentance and by accepting Yeshua as Messiah. So, I want to end with this idea that you can make a vow to God. You just have to follow, follow through with it. If you want to make a Nazarite vow to be completely separated unto God, you can do it, but you can't get out of it until the temple is rebuilt and you can offer your sacrifices. Any vow that you make, you need to be serious about it. You need to be willing to carry it through to the rest of your life. Because there's no way of getting out of a vow where you want to be consecrated to God until that temple is rebuilt. And I think that's why God, why, why Yeshua said, you know, don't make a vow. Essentially, don't make a vow that you cannot keep. Because nothing that you make as a vow can be short term until that temple is rebuilt. And our Father, our King, we pray... Lord, that above all, our vow would be to serve you, to honor you, to glorify you, to love you with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul, and to love our neighbor as ourself, and that we would vow to do as you commanded, to go out and make disciples, and Lord, bring people to a saving knowledge of Yeshua, and then build them up and let just let them hang. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do for us. We ask that your light would shine upon us as we uh, say the uh, priestly blessing here in just a moment or two. We praise you and thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen.